I just heard you just now. What did you say? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so I, before I start talking, I am going to let you go ahead and introduce <laughs> yourself. Um, because I am going to be spending the rest of the time probably chit-chatting, and obviously Becky will be chiming in too. Um, I'm not saying that she's not going to talk, but I'll let her go ahead and introduce herself. So go ahead, Becky. Yeah, that was really weird, Jeremy. Your like voice disappeared, and I was kind of like, did I like accidentally turn off my volume on this somehow? And I was trying to figure that out. Um, no, but I can hear you now. So, okay, my name is Becky Schwartz. I teach at um, Springport High School in Springport, Michigan, which is on the kind of western edge of Jackson County. Um, I teach ELA and uh, computer science. I also teach some social studies, but this year I am teaching um, English 10 and 11, both um, virtually and face-to-face uh, -face at the same time. It is, it is a fun time all about. Um, tonight I'm going to be moderating the chat uh, for you. So if you have any technical difficulties or if you have any questions, um, you can post them in the chat or you can send them to me. I'll also be dropping links in the chat as Jeremy needs to. And again, if you uh, need anything in the chat, let me know. Um, but yeah, really excited uh, for to learn more about HyperDocs with Jeremy tonight. Thank you so much, Becky. And as Becky said, we're going to be talking about HyperDocs tonight. And by no means, I want to. I'm going to throw out the disclaimer: Am I an expert in HyperDocs? I really want to give. Um, a big shout out to uh, Lisa Heifel, Kelly Hilton, and Sarah Landon uh, for all of their, Landis, for all of their work that they have done with the HyperDoc. If you have not invested in the HyperDoc handbook, I would uh, highly recommend uh, investing in it because it is awesome uh, and it definitely helps. And not only that, but there is a HyperDoc website, which we are going to be taking a look at tonight uh, and will definitely be beneficial for you. Um, Becky just popped the slides into uh, the chat again, so feel free to follow along. I'm going to leave my, uh, right now I'm sharing my screen, and right now what I'm going to do is leave my screen the way that it is because I think it's better to just follow along and better for me to kind of go from there. Um, the first thing that I uh, want to say is that um, we are um, coming to you from the Chippewa River Writing Project, and um, this is a site of the National Writing Project, and we are located at Central Michigan University. Um, and our site is supported only through grants and professional development work that we do through schools or regional RESDs, okay? And uh, teacher consultants that are involved in the 2022-2021 series, uh, we are donating our time, and all of the things that we do, really, we do, do donate our time. Uh, we put in a lot of time to this, and it's not a thing where I'm like pleading with you, but um, <laughs> but we do put in a lot of time and energy, and we just want to say thank you for all the people. Um, really, I know Becky and I would really like to thank the people that are going to be presenting through this series because we have some awesome people uh, speaking, and I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about the other people that are going to be speaking through this series that are really great. Um, if you appreciate the ideas that uh, we are giving you, um, we would definitely like you to support our work, and you can do that through giving.cmich.edu, um, and then you just select the Michigan, uh, the Chippewa River Writing Project. And if you're interested in having us work with your school or district, you can contact um, Dr. Troy Hicks. Uh, you've heard him talk talking early on. Um, he is our director of the Chippewa River Writing Project, and he can help you in terms of determining what is best for your uh, site or your district. And you can find out more information about CRWP at Chippewa River wp.org. So with that being said, I'm going to kick off and talk to you about who I am. Well, I am a middle school teacher um, and I currently teach sixth grade English, seventh grade science. And um, I got to choose what my, uh, my exploratory class is. And I'm teaching a class called Media Literacies. And it has been a fantastic ride so far. Um, and I wish I had time to just talk about that. But um, it's been a really good, positive year, and I, I'm teaching like how Becky's teaching, um, teaching face-to-face, -face, and I have some remote students as well, and so they chime in, and I'm doing synchronous, so they have to be in my class at the same time that I'm teaching, and I tell you what, some of those little lovelies don't want to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning, so it's kind of fun to watch them you know, uh, crawl out of bed. So, um, But uh, I'm also a teaching consultant uh, for the Chippewa River Writing Project. Um, I've been uh, the privilege, had the privilege of working with NCTE um, as a community ambassador. And then um, also for the last two years, I've had a wonderful opportunity to work with KQED um, 
out of, uh, as a media literacy innovator, and that has been fantastic experience. And um, uh, there's lots of different things through um, KQED that are great resources for you to use in your cl uh, classroom. Okay? Um, you can find me on Twitter at Jeremy B. Baller. I know Becky um, has her um, uh, has a Twitter account too because I follow her. And she does some great work. Um, and I think, Becky, am I right? You're going to be presenting on your digital writer's notebooks in this series? Am I right in saying that? Yes, I am. Um, I believe my date is in December. Um, so I'll be presenting on digital writer's notebooks and how to uh, capture some of that magic uh, in this weird time of where you may not be with your students all the time and they're working maybe asynchronously. And uh, how do you guide them um, and give them direction and also but give them the freedom of a writer's notebook? Yeah, and it's awesome. And I've actually adapted the things that Becky is, has uh, presented. She presented in the summer in my classroom. So I highly recommend that one. And you can also contact me through email as well. So thank you, Becky, for putting your uh, Twitter handle in there. So let's keep moving along. Um, looking at this session, we're going to explore how HyperDocs can be utilized and modeled for students. Um, this is going to be a session where we explore just the basics of HyperDocs and discuss different possibilities uh, for classroom use. And yes, that's even including special education. And let me just be clear, when I say classroom use, I also mean in terms of a virtual space as well, uh, knowing that some of us are either all virtual or we have some students that are uh, virtual and we're kind of doing that hybrid model. Okay, um, So um, some ISTE standards. Standards. Um, just kind of want to um, acknowledge ISTE standards for teachers. I'm not going to go through and reading those, but really when we're talking about HyperDocs, um, yes, you won't be able to see me right now. So I do have my camera turned off, just trying to preserve some bandwidth there. Um, but uh, the learner, the designer, and the facilitator, you can read through those, in, those ISTE standards. They're um, great standards to follow. Some other standards that you could be looking at too uh, are things like Common Core. Um, and so that's also some uh, places you could look for standards to adapt uh, those uh, HyperDoc, uh, the HyperDoc usage. So let's go ahead and dive right in. Let's talk about HyperDocs. What is a HyperDoc? Well, first of all, HyperDoc is really a digital lesson plan. And it can also be a digital, not just a digital lesson plan, but it can be a digital uh, lesson plan or a digital uh, unit as well. Um, and it can be a Google Doc or it could be on slides as well too. I've seen HyperDocs used on uh, not only Google Docs, but also on SlideWorks. And so you could use both spaces. Um, some people ask, well, can you use it on something like Microsoft Word? Uh, if you had like the online version of Microsoft Word, and I'm not exactly sure what that's called, <laughs> I apologize, but I think you could probably uh, be able to use it there. Um, but really a HyperDoc is designed to be able to use hyperlinks. Um, and it, it is a central location where learners can find that information. Um, and it's a place where there's links that are available for the activities you want students to do. It's kind of like a one-stop shopping place for students um, where they can look for things. And we're going to look at some examples, so don't, don't worry. Um, so we'll definitely look at some examples, and we're going to give you time to explore the HyperDoc site. Um, it, what it is is that it is adaptable. Um, I find HyperDocs are very adapt adaptable, not only in terms of going from like class to class, but they're also adaptable really on the fly. Uh, what worked what, what worked really well for one class or maybe one group of students that you're using this for may not work for another group and you may have to change a link and you can change those links fairly quickly. Um, and it's innovative. Uh, we are in a time of innovation. And so why not use something that can be very innovative and very helpful uh, for our students and also helpful for us as well. So what is not a hyperdoc? Well, it's not an easy solution to online learning. And I know that in this day that we might be looking for those things, but we don't have an easy solution for online learning. Uh, and if you have that magic pill, please let us know so that we can have a conversation with you. Um, and it is not a way to keep students busy either. Yes, it will keep students busy, but that's not the main goal of a HyperDoc. Um, as we go through this evening, you'll see some of those things in terms of why it's keeping students busy. Um, it's really not an, off, uh, an offline option um, because you do need those hyperlinks uh, to be able to direct students to different places, um, and it's not difficult. So a HyperDoc is definitely not difficult for uh, a beginning user. Um, I will say that there is some front loading that does need to be done with HyperDocs, and so that could be a little time consuming, but it's not difficult to use by any stretch of the imagination. So um, 
the next thing that I want to talk about is just those basic elements of a hyperdoc. And you're going to see those um, when we go with our next, the next slide that I use uh, or that I have here with exploring hyperdocs as we go through some of them. But um, there's, there's a, some kind of subcategories that uh, the, the co-authors have kind of uh, basically narrowed down, and that's to engage, explore, explain, apply, reflect, and extend. Um, these main areas are really helping students uh, to be able to go out and do some more um, exploring on their own, especially that extend part. Um, I really think a, a lot about um, some work um, that uh, some colleagues here in Michigan have done um, with the extending part and uh, really can help our students extend their learning and the reflection part too. That's what I really like about HyperDocs is that really does allow our students to reflect. Um, but we'll get into these different elements a little bit later on. This this slide is not, I am not a person that goes through and reads the slides, so I'll let you read those. I really want to get into, um, dive in into the meat and potatoes of this. Um, and I want to talk about um, exploring HyperDocs. Now, uh, the title up at the top of this, if you're on the slide presentation, will take you right to the HyperDocs website. And I'm just going to click over to that right now. So my computer will take a minute uh, to click over to this. This is HyperDocs.co. Um, and Becky, if you could drop that link also into the chat, that would be fantastic. Um, this is a free website that the authors have put together. Um, there is information here that is very abundant. And what I mean by that is this website, you can easily, easily fall into the rabbit hole of just exploring this website over and over and over because there is so many great resources here. Uh, they do offer some courses on HyperDocs, uh, some paid courses. They do have a HyperDocs boot camp that you could enroll in uh, to become that um, expert in HyperDocs. Uh, but there's also some information about the book. Um, the, the media tab that is right up here, um, they have been featured, HyperDocs have been featured on uh, Jennifer Gonzalez's Cult of Pedagogy, great podcast. Uh, overall, but really a great podcast. This episode of HyperDocs was really a great podcast too, as uh, Jennifer interviewed the authors of HyperDocs. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. Um, but uh, if you look here where it says find, underneath the tab where it says find, it says templates, samples, and then there's HyperDocs. And so I can actually go in and I can click on this and I can see lots of different templates that can be used in HyperDocs. And so I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole and click on any of these. Um, I'm going to allow you to do that um, uh, when you um, are uh, getting some time to play around. But again, that is on the HyperDocs website. Uh, it's underneath Find, and hopefully you can see my, um, my cursor and where I'm going. Um, and um, I'm just going down here. You can do some basic HyperDoc lessons. There are some creative writing. There's some ThingLink animal report uh, HyperDocs. There are some five E's and then the explore, explain, apply. And we're going to get into those ones. You can do some on respiration and photosynthesis. Um, so I apologize if you're having some difficulty with that. Um, so here you can see that there are lots of different. Um, all right. So Carol saying she can see it. Thank you, Carol. Um, and then also uh, underneath find, if you click on samples, there are some samples of HyperDocs as well. And you can see that they have them uh, kind of ca categorized, okay? Um, so there's mathematics, there's science, okay? Um, and there's reading and writing, there's history. So I'm not going to read through all of them, but you can even see that there's some holidays here. Um, there's lots of different things. And this website is designed for you to obviously take some of the stuff that's on here. But what the authors ask you to do is if you do take something, that you leave something as well. Um, so um, I would highly recommend that if you do take something off from this website, that you take a few moments and that you actually um, uh, leave uh, something that you've done. So if you take a template and you create a template, then go ahead and, and leave what you did and then that way you can help guide other teachers. It's free to sign up for the website, as you can see. Um, it's, it takes virtually minutes to, um, to sign up and then uh, you get all of these great things. And then also you will get emails from them when they are having some of those paid courses as well. 
Um, so before we go any further and I walk you through an example of a hyperdoc, um, so that way you kind of get a feel for them, I'm going to let you, I'm going to give you like five minutes to go ahead and just play around with the site and to explore the site. Again, that's hyperdocs.co um, that you can go to. Um, and then I'll call you back here uh, in about five minutes. So we're looking at, it's, it says 719 on my clock, so about 724, 725. Um, so take a few minutes and play around with HyperDocs uh, website. Um, again, you might get sucked into the rabbit hole, but uh, I'm going to let you at least take five minutes to get sucked into that rabbit hole. Okay, so hopefully you had a chance to look at the website a little bit, and hopefully I can pull you out of that rabbit hole and you can come back a little bit um, with us and uh, take a look at a couple of templates. And you'll see here on the slide that I have some visuals of those templates i'm going to drop the link in there and because you can find these templates and i didn't put a link on the slide because you can find these templates in our uh, in the hyperdoc website but i'm going to drop that in there anyways um, this is the first one this is the basic one and this is the one that i like the most because it really does it's it's basic and it helps me in terms of what i'm trying to formulate for my students and so it goes through those different uh, the subsections that the author is or the authors have talked about, uh, which is engage, and this is kind of like that that moment where you're trying to that section that you want to try to get your students uh, kind of capture their attention. That hook um, is what I what I always tell people. Um, you know, in terms of almost like a story, you're trying to get them hooked into what it is that you're doing. Uh, oftentimes, that engaging part could be something like a a, a reading piece that you do. Do, or it could be something along the lines of a video um, and you'll see uh, what I what I've done in my example that I show you here in just a little bit um, but this is the area where you would want to think about how am I going to get my students attention how am I going to get them to focus on this particular topic um, and then the explore part of that is where you might have them doing some uh, reading and maybe even watching the videos um, I like how they included the term infographics you might have them do some reading off from an infographics, but you're really having them explore the topic and you're really having them kind of just synthesize and think about, reflect back a little bit on and, and all the things that they're doing in this explore section. So you really want them to try to get a base knowledge of whatever the topic that you're choosing to use. And then the other part that goes into this is this explain part um, with, with uh, you would use this part of the hyperdoc to explain what it is that you want them to do. What is is your main objective that you're trying to get across to the students and what that is whether you are delivering a hyperdoc to each individual student that's the same or maybe you have groups of students and you're giving each of those groups a hyperdoc to work off from and then you can create an assignment for them to apply what they've learned and that assignment could be something um, where you're using they're using certain web tools maybe they're just using something like a google document or they're collaborating on um, maybe it's something where you have them using a web tool um, that is uh, something like um, Flipgrid, where they're recording a video and they're doing that outside of school, or they could be doing it inside of school too. Um, but wherever that is that you want them to apply what they've learned within that particular topic. And then there's this idea of sharing, um, where you're collecting all the students' uh, work and then you're giving them feedback and you're um, in including any kind of um, sharing that you might do with the students in terms of other students' work. Um, so you're giving them that that authentic audience in terms of the work is going out to not just you as the teacher, but their work could be going out to um, many people on the internet for a blog. It could be going out to their classmates. So there's an opportunity here to do that. And then obviously, like I was mentioning earlier, the reflecting and the extending pieces are huge for me uh, because you could have um, the students do some reflecting on what they learned. And this could be a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you have over a Zoom meeting or a Google Meet meeting um, with your students if you're virtual. Um, and even if you're not virtual and you're face-to-face, -face, you can still do some reflection pieces with your students. And then again, asking the students to go on and, be, and inquire about this. So more inquiry. Have them explore the topic further and what did they learn more about the topic. And you want to try to create a lesson within the HyperDoc that's going to get them to want to go out on their own and to do more out on their own. Um, and so you'll see some of that in what I'm doing. Um, and then um, another potential um, uh, template that is easy to use, and I'm going to drop in here um, in the 
in the chat. I'm going to drop the link to this. Um, but uh, what you can do is kind of similar to what I just showed you. It's a little bit of a different format um, that you could do. Uh, um, but here is the link to this one. And um, again, this is a, a little bit different because the engaging part might be like a whole group activity that you're having them do to get them engaged. Um, and then you can see some um, different things here. I'm not going to go through and read each section, but you can see that there's a different setup. And again, these are both done on a Google document, but if you are exploring the HyperDocs website, you will see that there are many teachers that do it on a Google slide. Um, and I think that's just, that works just as well uh, there too. So what I would like to be able to show you next going through my presentation is I would like to throw, show you two different examples. One example is something that I created last spring uh, for my sixth graders and it is dealing with um, combining sentences with the most dangerous game. And uh, you can click on, if you're in the presentation, you can click on the links down at the bottom of the screenshots. And then this other one here on the right hand side is one that um, we actually put, I put together with my colleague um, that works uh, closely with Troy and also um, we work with on Beaver Island, but um, I worked with uh, William Pangle on creating one for some adult learners, but this could also be something for high schoolers and you can adapt it to middle schoolers uh, as well. So I'm gonna click on my HyperDoc first um, and show you what I created. And this, gets, this was able to get distributed to my students. And so I changed the title up a little bit and said, start your engines. And so I had them go out and watch a video. It's the Quibi uh, version of the most dangerous game. So a very updated version of the most dangerous game uh, to hook them to get their, it's that attention getter. Um, and then um, what I put here in the comment section is because I didn't want to put links to where my students were doing work. Um, so I just put in here, like, add the link here. So they would have a link, and then they would have to answer a writing prompt on a shared Google document. And I want that to be a shared space because I want them to be able to see other people's responses. Um, and so uh, that, that uh, writing prompt is dealing with describing a time when they were involved in activity. It wasn't what you thought it was. Um, especially after they watch this video in terms of trying to, uh, this guy trying to outrun people that are going to kill him. Um, and then I asked my students to respond to at least one classmate in that Google Doc. So that kind of gets them started. And then um, I asked them to explore something for me. And I want them, and I asked them, to, when I asked them to explore, I asked them to think about it. So I want them to think about what is a simple sentence? What is a compound sentence? And this is a, this is a lesson that they are doing later on in the year doing this last spring uh, in a remote setting because of COVID. Uh, but here is a, an example of um, what I want my students to think about. Simple, compound, complex sentences. And then the question of why do they think authors use those different types of sentences? So really getting them to think about why, why do we have to know these different types? What's so important about them? And then I asked them to write a response in their online interactive notebook. Um, and this is something this year that they're actually doing their on live interactive notebook in their Google slides, thanks to Becky and to another one of our writing project colleagues that does this as well um, in terms of using Google slides. And so again, I just said you would drop a link here. And then I left these links in here because these are links. Um, I use a program called Grammar Flip with my, with my students. Um, and so they would go into Grammar Flip and they would complete this lesson. So it's a link to the Grammar Flip website. And then I asked them to also check out Grammar Girl. Um, that's quick and dirty tips slash Grammar Girl uh, so they can get some more information on compound sentences. So I want them to really think about sentences and I want them um, to be able to think about um, the, the idea of how authors use um, those sentences. And I think Carl, Carol had a question. It says, in a shared Google Doc, how do you keep students from writing over each other and having trouble being on the same doc? Ah, okay. So... That is a really good question. So this particular document, because I use Google Classroom and we are a Google school, what happens is that this um, is put into Google Classroom. And then if all of you that know Google Classroom, it creates a copy for each student. So each student is actually creating, uh, it'll create their own copy of the HyperDoc for them. Now, in terms of if I'm having them go out onto another document to write, what I typically do is set up my Google document with a table so it's got their own boxes and I tell them to write in their own box and so that's a way to help keep it organized 
Um, and yes, you can do that. You can do this in groups. And we'll talk a little bit different about what groups might look like opposed to an individual. So yeah, no problem. I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you very much for uh, being willing to ask that. Um, so there's the explore part. And then the explain part is then they're going to go ahead and I'm going to give them a link to, um, to follow link to the most dangerous game. And there's a couple different ways that you could do this. Um, one is that you can go out because it's uh, public domain. You can go out um, and find the most dangerous game and you can actually um, have them read it. Um, so without having to purchase it. And then there's another way that you could actually have them go to like a YouTube. Um, if you're adapting this to a special education class or to students that might um, need something read to them, you could uh, have a link to a YouTube um, uh, video or YouTube audio where it's it's reading it for them. Um, so, but I asked them to be able to read that. And then as they're thinking about their reading, um, they would go on to back to that shared Google document. Um, and, and then they're going to think about the moves that the author made with the different types of sentences. So I'm, I'm trying to tie it back into why and have them apply the lessons that they learned in Grammar Flip to what it is that they're reading in class. Um, and so then as they're getting all that done, and this isn't something that's done in one day. This would be something that would probably take them two or three days to go through. Um, and then have them apply what they've learned and have them do a flip grid. And again, you would add the link here where I said add a link. And then in their recording, you can see that I would have them uh, discuss their thoughts about the story, what really shocked or surprised them, um, what were some racial inequalities that exist story, and does this have a place in literature today, and to explain your thinking. Um, so there's a way for them to apply what it is that they just got done reading up here. And then going down to the share part, this is where they would write a one-page story that is basically an introduction uh, to a, a story that mirrors the most dangerous game. So trying to get them to kind of mimic what was done uh, in that story. And so there's some things that they have to include. And you'll notice down here that I had them include the different types of sentences. And then they have a shared folder. This would be a link here. They have a shared folder that they would throw that into. But I'm trying to get them to apply what they learned uh, throughout this lesson. And then there's some reflecting stuff, reflecting options here uh, for them. And I want them to create a Google slide deck so they can reflect on what they have done or they can respond to two other classmates on Flipgrid um, by Thursday with those Flipgrids that they created. And then extending this, they can go through and they can look at the movie that was from 1932 of The Most Dangerous Game. And maybe they could um, share with you what their thoughts were on that and compare it to the Quibi a movie that's out now. Um, and then there's a summary of the themes of the most dangerous game. There's a stop motion. There's tons of stop motion Lego videos out there on YouTube for the most dangerous game. Um, so there's lots of different things that you can add. And I even said, what else could you add here? Um, so please share if you have any other ideas that students could do. So this is sixth grade. Um, and you're thinking, wow, isn't that a pretty advanced book for sixth grade? And we do a lot of discuss, discussing on it. Um, so, but they, they tend to do fairly well with it. And they just kind of, uh, I think for the most part in the spring when my students did it, they, they were more or less just, they had a lot of questions and they were really good about um, how things were going along in the, the plot and in the setting. So, but this is one way that you could set up a Google Doc. Um, and so again, I talked earlier about that, um, making sure that you're ready uh, to deliver this to the students, um, taking the time, uh, that front loading, um, that there is a lot of front loading that goes into this. I would say that this particular hyper doc probably created, took me a little over an hour to create, if not a little bit longer. Um, I can't pin down the exact time for you. I apologize, but um, and I want to emphasize that you do this with every one of your lessons. Um, you know, you do this with maybe some of your big X, or maybe do this with a, a lesson, the other lesson that you want to try um, to kind of the ground. Um, but the possibility um, that you could use with sixth grade. The other link in there, and continue. If you have questions, you can drop them in the chat. Um, the other one that we created more for like a high school, more of adult kind of thing. Um, we created this in a uh, professional development that actually Troy was too. Um, where we were um, trying to get individuals to go and do some work uh, in a virtual setting. Like if we're trying to teach students science at home, what could we have them do? And so doing a hyperdoc is a really great way to try to get them to do some of this stuff. And so we had them engaged. Here's our nice big picture of our cow. Um, so there was an introductory video on invasive species because this is basically what this hyperdoc was about. 
Um, and then some questions about is a cow an invasive species in Michigan? Why or why not? Um, and then um, we asked them to do some thinking in a Google document um, and then think a little bit further about what is an invasive species, giving them a definition, and then also having them go to other places. And I think this is important to kind of cross-reference and teaching our students to cross-reference and giving them places where there's different definitions and what is the definition of an invasive species by National Geographic opposed to National Wildlife, what, what compares, what contrasts, so things that you can get students to think about. And then there was this explore part, and this was what was really fun, where we put some different uh, pictures of uh, invasive species that are in, uh, in Michigan and then, or that are in the United States. And then what we had them do is we had them go out and explore some sites on invasive species. And then they had to go and think about how do we get rid of them. And then they had to also think about, um, we had them go and find invasive species in their own backyards. Um, and it was very easy because we had them use a plant identification app, which is what you see right here. Um, we gave them some different platforms. And so you could do this with students that are at home. You can say, all right, um, so here are some plant identification apps, whether you have an Apple or an Android. Uh, so you can go out and you can do, um, do some plant identification. And then we asked them to report back the next day. Um, and I'm not going to go through and read all this. but um, So we created a Padlet wall for them to share, um, or they could use Google Sheets to organize their data data and try to figure out how their data and this was a this was a the learning was in the struggle at this point and this is something that we do every year with our participants at Beaver Island but this is something you can do with your students too to try to get them to understand how do they organize data so that the data can tell us the, the appropriate story based on what they found and then we had some reflection questions and, and then we just extended it by having them think about what are some aquatic invasive species in Michigan um, so what's the Michigan invasive species for plants uh, what's, what are all the invasive species in just the Great Lakes? And so lots of different places where students could extend their learning. And in this case, it was our, our adult learners where they could go and they could learn some more things about invasive species. So uh, kind of similar to the sixth grade one, but there were some different activities that they could participate in uh, for this. Uh, so I'm going to take a minute because I've been talking a lot. Um, yeah, the, the learning is in the struggle. So absolutely. Um, and I actually got that from Dr. Hicks, so I can't take credit for that one. So I don't know where it originated from. Um, but I'll take a pause here for a moment. Does anybody have any questions um, about the examples that I showed or just in general hyperdocs? Um, my plan was for you tonight to see the scaffolding that takes place in terms, you know, I wanted you to see examples, wanted you to play around the website, and then those things. So. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you were able to uh, answer any, or we can answer any questions that you have. Because I like these lessons, I allow students to learn more independently, but they also students to collaborate great first. Yes, absolutely. Um, and that's one thing we didn't, I haven't really addressed yet is this collaboration. So yeah, you can definitely have students do it individually, but then what's, what's really great about HyperDocs is that you could create um, virtually, let's say you have five groups in your classroom, you could really push it out so that uh, the HyperDoc is different for each one of those groups if they're exploring a different topic together and collaborating on. Um, and so that's one of the differences that you can make in terms of interchanging those links. Um, and what I was trying to say earlier um, is with special education is I really think this is adaptable to special education because um, you can link to audio that students need to have things read to them. Um, you can adapt it in terms of if they are supposed to have reduced assignments or they're supposed to have extra time. Um, so this would allow those different accommodations that you would need for those students. And that's what I really like about HyperDocs too. And again, it's that one place where everything is at. And I know at least with the experience in the last two to three weeks with my sixth graders, they are really trying to keep all of the balls up in the air in terms of the juggling of the different Google Classrooms that they have. And so this is one of those things where it would be really easy where you could, if they're asking you a question about, well, where do I find this? Well, go over there and find it. Um, so um, and not go over there in the HyperDoc. It's right there underneath the Explore section. Oh, that's great. So they can go there and they know where it's at. Um, and yes, I agree that Common Lit has an audio section for theirs, and it's awesome. So uh, it is a more free 
Mediterranean, but it's okay, yes. So it does meet that need that we have to have. So any other questions before I kind of talk about the kind of the curriculum part of this um, in terms of thinking about some other things? Yeah, Becky, go ahead. Yeah, um, can everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. So I with I wanted days with you on the Asians in special education. Um, I have a blessed um, co-teacher who is English uh, major as well, and she um, quite often when we do hyperdocs um, will assign it to each and every student, and she'll go in for their different accommodations, and she'll tell them um, she'll put like a comment: you don't need to do this section, or you only need to do three of these. You can choose from this, um, and so that's great. It's individualized. It's quick. It's easy. It doesn't involve a lot of like shared prep time together because I can just assign it um, or schedule it or whatever um, we want to do with it and she'll just go right in and do that for those kids. All right. So, all right. Um, there we go. So, uh, as I was saying, I'll say it again. Um, one of those things that I really like about HyperDocs too is going from class to class. I know this year my first hour sixth grade class opposed to my second hour uh, first grade or second sixth grade class is different so i know that i would probably pop a different link in there and that's really quick to do um you know so if i have a backup link of like oh yep that video is not gonna work it kind of bombed in in first hour i can put it into second hour so lots of different possibilities in terms of just quickly interchanging some of those parts out um, with hyperdocs so the last couple things i really wanted to talk about tonight too was Thinking about universal design for learning in HyperDocs. Um, and the definition, and this came from Wikipedia, because uh, I wanted to, I was trying to find a definition. I know what it is in my head, but trying to get it out into a simpler form, it was easier for me to go grab a definition. But universal design for learning is a set of principles that allows teachers with a structure to develop instruction to meet the diverse needs of all learners. And that's where I think the hyperdocs come into play is we can meet the needs of all the learners, whether they are in person uh, or whether they are online. And so the hyperdoc really does allow this. And how does it meet those requirements? Because it allows me to change parts out and meet in terms of what it is that they need. And that might be you know, I have a lower reader um, or a lower group of readers, and maybe with a hyperdoc that I developed for them is a little bit different. So I can universally design something that is not necessarily for all students, but I can do it for groups of students. And that's where that universal design comes into play. And, and I don't know if Troy would like to say anything about universal design. I am not trying to put him on the spot, but Troy, is there anything you'd like to say about that as well? There are a number of different ways to kind of think about universal design. And one of the ways that I've heard it described before is the difference between um, creating a meal for everyone to eat as compared to or creating enough food for your table that everyone can eat rather than trying to differentiate and provide the gluten-free option and the vegan option and the low carb option and the paleo and this and that. And I'm not giving it enough nuance right now. And I'm sure that you could probably do a quick Google search and find the people who are um, better versed at that saying that. But I think the universal design principle that Jeremy is uh, getting at here and this idea about the hyperdocs is that we're really trying to provide students with opportunities to engage in the material through multiple means and then also to express themselves and share their understanding through multiple means and uh, depending on exactly what, what you choose to do with your hyperdoc and the types of opportunities that you have students create, um, you know, there are times where we want them to write a paragraph or to write an essay, but maybe there are times where it's okay for them to create uh, an infographic or record a podcast or record a short screencast or video. And I think that when we get more and more into that mindset and we give them some choices, um, that can be really powerful. So 
that's kind of the way I think about it is trying to provide as many options for as many students as possible while still adhering to the, the main learning objective uh, that you have. Yeah, definitely. And more specifically for me, I know that um, it, it helped. I mean, since going through the Summer Institute and the writing project, it has helped me in terms of how I assess my students. And I think that's what a hyperdoc can help you with in terms of allowing students to to have that option of showing you what they've learned. And so what are the number of different ways that they could show you without having it be a multiple choice test or having it be maybe a, you know, a, a, a paragraph or a big, huge, long essay. Um, you know, and yes, those, there are times that those are necessary, but um, a hyperdoc can afford you to allow students to uh, be assessed in different uh, ways. So, um, so that's with universal design. And the other thing too that comes to, to comes to my mind comes to our mind is Bloom's taxonomy. Um, and I'm not going to go through and read Bloom's taxonomy. I think all of us know what Bloom's taxonomy is. Um, the one thing that um, you'll notice is that there's kind of some of the same verbiage in Bloom's taxonomy that is occurring also in HyperDocs. Um, one of the great things that I like about the top of Bloom's taxonomy is that create piece um, because we as teachers are being creative and we're being innovative in terms of how we're delivering content to students with using a HyperDoc. But also, there's the other part of that is that we are allowing students to be creative and to produce some new and original work. Um, so that was the one part that I really wanted to point out out of Bloom's taxonomy. And then the rest of it kind of speaks for itself there. Um, and again, we're not here to learn about Bloom's taxonomy. We're here to learn about HyperDoc. So, but I did, I did want to highlight that part of it. Okay. Um, so as you're thinking about HyperDocs, um, we can um, extend your HyperDoc toolbox and your knowledge um, uh, not to kind of uh, float my own boat here, but um, I did write a middle web post uh, on using HyperDocs during the time of uh, that we were teaching online for COVID in the spring. Um, there is the how to HyperDoc slide deck templates that you can look at. There's also some rubrics. And then there's a link to that podcast that I mentioned earlier with Jennifer Gonzalez and the Cult of Pedagogy, where she interviews the authors. And again, that's a very, uh, very good podcast to listen to. So there's some other resources for you to investigate in terms of how uh, to use HyperDocs and also to um, explore. Um, Again, the, the website hyperdocs.co is a website you will definitely lose time and can get sucked into that, that time warp. Um, so as we're, we're kind of wrapping things up here, um, you know, first of all, I want to say thank you, but I want you to also think about what are some next steps that you have as you're, as you're processing and you're reflecting on our webinar tonight and excluding the technical difficulties, um, what are some next steps for you? Uh, do you want to purchase and read the HyperDoc handbook? Are you looking to exploring the site more? Do you want to discuss this with colleagues? Um, I've actually had some conversations with my colleagues and they didn't have any clue about a HyperDoc and, um, and so they wanted to know more. And so I've been spending some time talking to my colleagues about that or are you ready to just dive right in and, and sometimes that's the best way to do it and implement it. So um, feel free if you would like to, you can go ahead and you can uh, in the chat if you want to kind of record or, or and write down what you feel like you want to do. Um, you can do that, and also, if you have any questions before we go through the last couple of slides, this would be the time to do that as well. So, what are your next steps that you want to do? Definitely need to share some of my colleagues, Megan says. <laughs> so, all right, just purchased the book. I'm so excited. Good, I'm so glad. So, so glad. Jump right in. All right, I like, I like your mentality, Christine. Explore more versions of hybrid. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, you really do need to find what fits for you, um, I feel. You know, I think it's 
it's definitely not something where you just go, oh yeah, that template's great, Jeremy. You're gonna definitely have to find the ones that fit for you. So that's ready to dive in. So yes, I am too. Figured out if I can do these in a Microsoft platform. Yeah, I think if you have the online stuff for Microsoft, I think you can well, you would be able to do it. So Derek wants to share this with his colleagues and dive into the site. Dragging some colleagues with me, yes. <laughs> Oh, oh, okay, so how long would you say it took your class to complete your hyperdoc assignment? So the particular one with the most dangerous game, that took them because it was new, um, new to me. Um, I gave them the week to complete it. Sixth grade, I gave them the week. So one week it took them to complete that. So writing workshop, oh yeah, I think this would work awesome with writing workshop. So definitely awesome. So good, I'm seeing lots of different ways. Diving in. Bless you. Whoever sneezed. <laughs> Thinking about synchronous and asynchronous. Yes, absolutely. That's definitely something I have to think about. Is um, you know, for, for the sp spring, I had synchronous. Obviously, we couldn't require to be synchronous. This year can require them to be um, because we are one school and can require them to do that. Um, so it's a little bit of a story, but yes. Oh, yeah. So you might not be able to discount. Sorry, Allison. They're probably just coming to me. Yep. Set up their blog. Hyperdoc. Yeah, absolutely. Be a great way to kind of go by step. And another another layer to add into this too it's about like going out in videos so there's a couple things about number one you could talk to students about fair use copy laws things like that things that you're grabbing that you're using talk be a great segue into um with those things and then the other the other part about is that uh, you could have them you know it's more of a, an instruction you could have them follow uh, with those types of things hyperdocs can definitely have oh will you share links and recording with that oh, yep so oh, he will so awesome thank you so last couple things um, that I uh, not to uh, my own boat here, but uh, I have co op books with uh, Dr. Um, that are, um, and you want to ever have a conversation with me teaching grammar and how that works in the crazy COVID world. No, um, I love, love grammar, uh, teaching grammar, especially in age and having some awesome, uh, conversations with uh, students who want to learn grammar. It really is how you approach it with them. I say anybody's doing a bad job and hey, it's, it is how you. So, um, but you know, some of our books and you can contact me. I have my, and my Twitter there. Feel free to follow me on Twitter. Some private mess if you want to have a conversation. Um, and then our next um, session, or not the next webinar that we have with Dr. Trump. He's going to be talking about using breakout rooms with spaces. Um, so uh, we're looking forward to that on the 20th. And another one more thing, just want to, um, if any of this information was helpful and you feel so inclined to um, donate uh, to our website, um, there's the information on that slide. And, and if you're also interested in us doing any work for your school district or in your region, you can contact Dr. Troy Hicks for that and also find out more information on TripleRRiverWritingProject.org. Um, so there's lots of uh, things that we can help you with if you're willing. Um, oh, so Warren says my colleagues were sort of learning towards Google Form drill and kill grammar. Ah, no. <laughs> so yes, Warren, hit me up. So send me an email. We can talk. <laughs> So awesome. Thank you everyone so much for uh, attending. It sounds like you got something out of the webinar and that's what my main goal is whenever I present is that you are able to take something away. So that's fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeremy. We really appreciate it. Thanks to all of you for bearing with us. Uh, as I've said many times in the chat, we wanted to use the official university sanctioned web conferencing platform. Plus it made the registration process a little bit easier for us. We will reevaluate where we're at for our October webinar series. And yes, I get to be the host for that next one. Thanks to Jeremy and Becky, especially for their coordination of the entire webinar series. And as Jeremy just mentioned, all of our individual presenters throughout the school year, we will have this information up on our website as soon as possible, including a recording. And we'll also follow up with you on email. So. Thanks so much. We will hang out here for just a few moments after the recording ends if anyone has any questions. I don't know if you're even able to take your microphone with the settings that our webinar is set up with right now, but if you have other questions, we'll hang out for a few extra minutes. So thanks again, Jeremy. We really appreciate you presenting tonight, sir. So no problems. I want to say thank you to Becky too, because she's an awesome partner to work with and, and Troy's awesome to work with. And actually all writing project people are awesome. If you're not part of the writing project, I highly encourage you to attend some writing project uh, PD or attend a summer institute if you can do it, because it is a life changing experience in terms of teaching. So um, join us. So join our club, come to our side. <laughs>